and I look back and I say, wow, that's a huge difference. You know, I didn't know, I didn't realize I was living in poverty until my circumstances changed. And I look back and I realized that I was living in poverty, but it didn't feel like poverty to me. It was just my norm, you know? So. So, so I see some pictures that you did on a post on social media about resources and, and you posted, um, family department of children and families, um, uh, 24 seven, there was different groups that were at an event. I find that in America, we have so many resources, but we have so, we have such a lack of resourcefulness. Uh. So how, when families, a lot of the time, um, I would say a lot of people only go to, uh, you know, family therapy before they go to, you know, they only go at the end. Yes. Um, of a relationship instead of actually like having me mentors and coaches, right? Like, because right. I know you coach too. Yes. What is that? What is that? Like, what do you see for the future of what we need to do to be humans and really to understand? Because we're living like 100 years, right? Yeah. And, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, we're only living like 30, 40, maybe 50 years, you know what I mean? So we're right. doubling, we're going to quadruple life. Eventually we'll be. Like if you have enough money, you can live forever conceptually. Right. So for a long time, a couple hundred years. Uh, so, yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, I don't know, but we'll see. If, if, you know, with the way technology is going, I'm pretty sure they might find a way, but, you know, we just yeah, got to feel the way it is. I'm but I agree with forever. you. You're going to live forever? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, hey, I, I can't, I cannot fight your belief system. I'm in agreement with you. If there's a possibility to live forever, go for it. But um, um, what you ask about families do come towards the end when there's a problem, when it's going getting out of hand. That's when you want to come to the therapist and bring the problem child, fix him, so that our family could, be, could, could get together. No, fix us together as a family it's a systemic issue the problem is not the kids the problem is everybody who participated in the behavior of the child so the child is just reacting based on how you're acting towards him so i really i try to advise as many parents to get involved in their kids lives right i'm not a parent yet however i am a godmother i am a i am an auntie to 10 nieces and nephews all together so at a very young age, I had that motherly instinct because they pretty much raised in my hand. And one thing I found to be extremely important is investing that time, right? To build the kid emotionally, to help them build their character and help them understand life. And expert will tell you the first 10 years of a child's life are the most crucial. Why? Because their brain is developing, their environment. The kids are a product of their environment. So I would advise families not to wait until the end. People do not value therapy because of the stigma that's attached to it still, even in the 21st century, unfortunately. But we go to, to therapy to help us figure things out, to help us communicate more, because we don't really find those courses in undergrad or in high school that teaches us communication, how to effectively communicate. So when... The kids are going through their life stages. Parents are unable to meet them where they are because either it might be a lack of knowledge or just them trying to be protected. But as you understand the life cycle, you understand that the teenager seeks autonomy. So you have to give them that space to explore their autonomy as, long as at the same time still provide them with structure, but limited structure because they're still discovering who they are. So it's all a matter of training. I'm very passionate about it. I am passionate about doing conferences that educate families on how they can improve relationships, how they can start from the beginning um, where that child is first born to continue to love on the child, to give them that affection because it goes a long way. And it can really stop a lot of, or prevent a lot of mental illness that children go through right now such as suicidal thoughts, depression. You know, I've had, you know, teenagers cutting their arms because of stress or because of, they don't feel loved by their parents. So all of these issues could be avoided if the parents play their part. And 
you know, by, by, by holding or hosting conferences, by doing parenting courses and parenting classes, I definitely think that that education will definitely help them to change their perspective so that they can be aware of the role that they play in the issues that these teenagers or children display. So it starts with the parents, really. So I came up with this idea. I don't know if I heard it a long time ago, but the concept is, is if you break your leg, you're going to go to the ER room. But if you get hurt in your head, uh-huh. you're going to go to the bar. Mm, mm. that's interesting so or do drugs or mm-hmm. food or you know whatever those negative things are a lot of the time mm-hmm. negative coping skills so so i love um what you're talking about with it starts uh, with the parents it starts with you know uh taking accountability for you know us and I find that so many people, and I'm, I'm a deputy sheriff reserve, so I've done a reserve program in the last year and a half, and to be able to see law enforcement, so like policy and culture and, um, you know, somebody, an officer just took his life in Miami uh, this last week, and it, it's, it's, it's crazy because culture and policy need to shift on, you know, if, if we're having mental, some, some mental stuff, yeah. then how do we cope with it? And if it's not being dealt in the right way, it builds and then it gets taken out in a different way. Um, I look at it as like a cup of water and you just keep yeah. filling it and it's gonna overflow. Absolutely, and, and the same illusion that you used to go back from the beginning, we do use those negative coping skills. That's our coping mechanism. We run to the bar when we're hurting because we don't wanna experience the hurt, it's uncomfortable. What do we do when our heart is hurting? Whoa, this is weird, what are you talking about? And especially with men, they don't usually are expected to express themselves, right? Because men are taught to be strong, to be, you know, maso- masochistic. The word, you know what word I'm trying to say, but the language mas- is... Mas- masculine, masculine. Yes, to be masculine and just be strong and just have that out- outer um, strength that they, ooh, invincible. No, men have feelings too. Men have feelings and they have to be able to find this safe space to express themselves. I think it's very beautiful when a man cries because they're letting it out. And it doesn't mean that they are weak. It means that they are human. They go through things, they go through hurtful moments and they need to be able to release it, right? And going to drugs, going to bars, like I said, I work at a you know a re- recovery place right now and you hear their stories. The hurt was too much, they had to suppress it. And the high that they get from the drugs or the the sensation that they receive from the alcohol is great they don't have to talk about their problems they don't have to think about it right they're in a different world but one thing about using utilizing substance is that once that high is over you're left with those unresolved issues so we have to be able to find a different outlet to release our stress if it is exercise, if it is meditation, if it is journaling, if it is going on a three-day affordable vacation, you have to find that healthy coping skill that you can practice, that that positive self-care that you can engage in to be able to help you maintain your mental health before the mental illness occurs, right? And unfortunately, that officer took his life because Right now, it's very stressful. It's a very stressful time that we're in, and especially officers are under a lot of pressure. You know, society, everything that's been happening is just too much. Mentally, it's too much, and I feel that people need to be able to have that safe space where they can express themselves and not feel judged. And that's why I love therapy. You're talking to a stranger. As, As uncomfortable as that may seem, once you get in the zone and you start letting everything out, you feel much better. Even myself, I've been in therapy because I see the value. So I would say find out those positive outlets, get together with positive friends who practice positive coping skills that you can engage in to help you cope with those stress. Resulting to alcohol and drugs may be helpful temporarily, but if you continue to rely on it, that's when the addiction starts. You feel like you cannot live without it and you constantly need, you know, to, to do the drug, to be able to have a good feeling or to be able to 
forget about all of your stresses. The goal is not to forget. The, do the goal is to deal with them and learn to cope. So I was, uh, I, I always ask people when, you know, if, if a kid's doing drugs or somebody or alcohol, I ask them, do you want to feel or do you want to not feel? Mm. So what you guys do a lot of times is really understand the root and yeah. help people see the root. Mm -hmm. And I love like the motivational interviewing skills of yeah. asking the right question to get an answer because I find a lot of adults today, they uh, tell people what to do or what to believe. Yeah. They're not inviting them to grow and inviting them to be the best version of themselves and understand what's inside. They're just forcing extrinsic ideas, beliefs, concepts, values to definitely with our kids from yeah. the adult to the kid. And then we wonder why we have a, uh, some little kids that grow into big kids that never actually change their, their mindset or know how to think for themselves. Exactly. I am so sorry. I apologize. Very good. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, um, telling someone how to think instead of teaching them. And I think that's where society is failing these teenagers is that you're doing them a disservice by always providing them with the answers instead of allowing them to come up with the answers themselves. It's teaching them independence. It's teaching them leadership. And that's why I love therapy. Like you said, motivational interviewing. That's one of the techniques that I use in the, in the therapy room in addition to CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, where you train the individual or you help them to understand their thinking pattern and the, um, uh, the unhealthy thinking pattern that they maintain that causes anxiety or depression. Once, once they are aware that their thinking pattern is false, right? It's not, it's not realistic. Sometimes, not sometimes, that's what anxiety is. It's false um, assumptions that we have towards things, even that happen, and we start to formulate all these different theories that are unreal. So now we became anxious, and now it becomes a problem, right? We get addicted to it. So absolutely, teaching them, actually asking them, what are you feeling, so that they can get in the habit of expressing themselves. Once they get in the habit of expressing themselves, then they know when they grow up, okay, I'm able to identify what I am feeling right now and I can verbalize it to somebody versus having an adult man who has no idea how to express himself. So I love what you said about men a little earlier and tying in what, what you just said about expression. Yeah. Men in America are told to suck it up, be tough, and don't cry. Yeah. Yep. And I talk about this all the time when I, when I, when I work with students or our staff or – um, I just trained about 100, 150 officers, police officers in, uh, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia this summer. Nice. And I, I find it, I start off, you know, the first day with, with talking about this from my own experience. Because right. I talk about my experiences and what I know versus a lot of people always talk about, well, you know what, you, you know what I mean? And I'm like, I have no clue what you mean. Why don't you tell me your no. experience? So, so it's interesting on men because, I mean, I talk from man's point of view because I'm a man, and um, I love what you're saying, and I agree with you, you know, fully because it's, it's more, I believe it's harder to be vulnerable than it is harder to be tough. Absolutely. So if, if, somebody ha if somebody thinks that they can be tough, okay, be tough. Like, show me who you are as, as, a, as a human inside versus just your human outside where you're surface level with the whole entire world. Absolutely. And I love how you said you share your own story. You become a lot more relatable to the audience, right? Instead of just referencing things that you have read instead of things that you have lived. And that's what I hear often in the recovery room is that they like to have a sponsor because the sponsor lived what they're going through right now. So they're able to be more relatable to them than me who have never struggled with substance abuse in any way it's I'm knowledgeable about it because I went to school for it versus someone who actually struggled with addiction and who has recovered and now they are a mentor so that's the difference between a therapist and you know um a sponsor that they get from AA meetings so absolutely when you're speaking you have to use your life story as a point of reference so that people can identify with you so that people can understand where you're coming from that whoa 
she did live some pretty horrible stuff or he did live some pretty horrible stuff and he helps them to really have a better understanding 